Hi guys, I'm Dylan Hartley and I'm the new host of the England Rugby Podcast with O2 Inside Line. This week we've got the two big hitters, the two big boys, Jamie George and Billy Vonopola. Jamie George and Billy Vonopola, how are you? Yeah, good. Um, I think when you're on camp you're, you're not allowed to say you're tired, but I'm a bit tired. But um, Billy, you are always tired. You, I think if there's one man that can be tired, it's you because um, you actually sleep a good... Well, whenever you're not eating or training, you're sleeping, aren't you? Yeah, that's probably my best form of recovery. I only found out a few years ago it was good for recovery, so I just jumped on that wagon. Um, but if there's nothing going, if there's nothing interesting, then I'll just go to sleep and um, wake up rejuvenated, ready for the next session. <laughs> Lovely. GC, how are you getting on? How's it, how's it been uh, back in camp, mate? Yeah, it's good, mate. It's... Um... I think always before before you come in, you're a bit like nervous about that element of the unknown, you know. Um, what's this camp going to be about? What are the coaches sort of? What's the themes of, you know, our campaign going to be about? How are the bake? What are the bacon and eggs? How hard is that going to be? You know, all these things are going through your head. But no, it's been good, mate. Well, as soon as you're into camp, you're back with the boys. It's, it's great. So you need to explain to people that um, bacon and eggs and steak and eggs is not actual food. Yeah, it's not. It's um, it's basically. Um, Cold word for fitness for yeah. us forwards. Mandatory, and then, mandatory fitness. <laughs> yeah. And then for the backs is beach weights and have a stretch. I think that's all they do. I was going to ask you boys, throughout my whole career, and especially towards the end when I was being monitored within like an inch of my life, like my one thing I struggled with was like my, my body fat. Like it was up and down, up and down my body weight. And in my experience of, of playing, there's like two types of player there's a player who struggles to keep weight on and then there's a player who struggles to keep it off. And um, without making any assumptions, I'm assuming <laughs> that you two are in my camp. True or false? Yeah, yeah I'll retweet that one. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, how have you found it then, being, being home like in, in lockdown? Obviously, managing kind of training schedules and you know, your body fats and your diet and stuff like that. How's it been for you boys? I actually, I actually loved it, mate. Like I, um, so we're like for the, I, I spoke about it the other day. This for the first time in our careers, I felt like I was like an individual athlete. If that makes sense, like I got an appreciation for like Olympians and that sort of thing because, you know, you write your own program. I was lucky; I've got some weights at home. Um, England sent us back with a watt bike, of course. Um, so like we were in there, we, you know, and it was good. Like in terms of like the nutrition side of things, I was a lot more in control of it. And I think the one thing that I probably learned out of lockdown is that, you know, you can try a few things and there are a few things that I've now taken over and um, which allows me to try and keep the sum of my body fat off. Um, I love that. You know, like whenever you went back from camp, you'd get a Watt bike. Basically all year you'd have a Watt bike at home and you could do your little pickups on it. But then like the, the evolution is that sports science and Watt bike, they developed like that app where... England Rugby could log on to the app and you had to complete a session and they could see you complete the session. So you couldn't just say anymore, yeah, yeah I've done my Watt bike. Like <laughs> they knew when you'd done your Watt bike. Um, but I suppose it's the evolution of sport, right? And that, that big brother kind of element. Bill, what about you? Um, how's, how's the diet? How's the rig? Um, no, nah, it's good. Uh, I think I've talked about it a lot about my uh, wife being a dietitian. Um, and having no restaurant to open was probably a blessing in disguise for myself. Um, couldn't eat out, had no excuses to see the boys. Um, so yeah, that probably helped me unintentionally more than, than me going out there and trying to be, you know, good. I didn't get one of the Watt bikes. I think they ran out with the front five. So, um, I count myself lucky in that part. Other than that, it was, it is what it is. And we're back in camp now, even though it's a bit of a weird setup, it's nice to be in and around the boys. And uh, long may it continue. There was a couple of times still when, uh, in lockdown that I was like, out, about, like driving up Harpenden Road, going to take the dog out. I just see Big Bill up there on a road bike. <laughs> 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 it was so good because Harpenden Road's on a bit of a hill, mate, and he was on the incline. It was, uh, it was poetry in motion. As long as he didn't have an insulated delivery backpack on, I think we were all right. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we're far off. I'll tell you that. Honestly, no. I, I um, it was it was mad, and even like coming into camp because you think when we're not training or when you boys aren't training or recovering or, or sleeping, 
like a lot of the um, the social element and connectings around the table, around the food room, like everything happens in the food room, doesn't it? So like, I used to like really struggle, um, you know, every week would be like skim folds. And it's not like, it's not like in, um, in public, like you'd go to the doctors and a, a curtain gets pulled round. Like you just got to drop down to your kicks, like in the restaurant, you've got waiters and waitresses and there's like all these stuff and you're just there in your pants. Do you ever get the uh, early knocks for the, with, remember Hammer came to your room? Yeah, he used to come at my, come into my room at like 5.30, I used to, especially when I was sharing with Mac and he'd do it like every week and do my skin folds at 5.30 in the morning because it was like- Before when bacon you, and eggs. When you were fasted before bacon and eggs. I was like- <laughs> Oh my gosh. I, I found it really hard like staying on top of that, um, especially when like the, the social element of food uh, and camp was there. Can you put a bit of context around uh, goujons and chocolate, the, the importance and significance of that? Well, it's an ongo ongoing tradition, I think. It like, goes back to even before your time, Dill, I reckon, is it? Um, uh, I mean, some people have played with the recipe over the years and we weren't too happy about that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, like, I mean, as soon as I came into the team, it was like, mate, wait, to, like, you know, eat well, wait till Friday. Friday is like three o'clock. Goujons and chocolate biscuits is a bit of a routine. Uh, the day before a game is we usually do a captain's run uh, in the morning at the stadium, then come back and like the, the build up to a game so long. Most people, a lot of lads just go back to their room and you don't see them until kickoff basically. Whereas bringing in the goujons and chocolate in the team room at three o'clock on a Friday just you know brings everyone together. A um, bit of a social element. It's good for the soul too. You know when you get a bit of chocolate. You've had steak and eggs, bacon and eggs through the start of the week. Um, it's nice to have 20 or 30 goujons. Oh, Jinx, oh, there's one story I want to talk to you about, and uh, it probably leads on to where we're going to go. Um, for, for my kind of uh, twilight, I think, coming back into that England team post-2015 and having a run, you were basically just on my heels the whole time, and I felt it, everyone saw it, everyone knew it, and... I just had to keep going, I had to keep grinding. And like, even on my days off, Eddie would have me fighting like members of staff. And I remember there was one time in Kensington, we're at the Garden, uh, the Kensington Garden Hotel, that one on the park there. And it was the week off, we weren't playing, we just had a t you know, play Georgia on that Tuesday or something. And then on the Wednesday, it was like, we did conditioning downstairs. And I got partnered with you, Jinx. And um, it was like Eddie had like been training me to this point. And like, it's like Karate it, Kid, man. Yeah, but Cobra Kai, mate. It was Cobra Kai. Like the subplots were unbelievable. Like Eddie sat there, like he's like in Gladiator, like sat there in his big chair, like the Emperor, just like watching. And he was like, "Fight!" And like I was partnered with Jinx, and I just knew, and the whole team were there as well. Like the the backs had come in, and everyone was crowded around on the mats. And no one else probably thought of this, but I was thinking this. I was like, if I lose to Jinx in any of these wrestles, that my career is dust. I'm I'm done. I won't even make it out of the hotel. They put me in the skip. So every time Eddie was like, fight, I was like, I was just going to the end. Like I would have died on that match trying to beat you. And um, I think it'd be really interesting to, to know um, for, for people listening, like the dynamic of people challenging for positions within a team. Like Bill, you've got plenty of back row kind of competition. And Jinx, you know, I came through, you know, 10 years before you, you know, Steve Thompson, Lee Mears, um, all these boys competing with Younger. There's always competition, but I'll be interested to hear from, from you boys how, how you've always viewed it. I think it's so healthy, mate. Like, competition for places, obviously, like, we're so lucky to play in a team where, there, you know, there's a conveyor belt of good players. Um, and I always think for me, mate, I count myself lucky to have, have like been sat behind you for such a long period. I learned a huge, without sounding like a, you know, brown nosing, um, you know, I, I, uh, I learned a huge amount from you. And I think that that's, that's got to be the, the mindset that you have in that, you know, if you're just going to sit there and sulk and worry about not playing, for example, like then, you know, you're not making the most of the opportunity that you can have. Um, and I just think that when, I think that there would have been times when, you know, we were, hopefully we were pushing each other both to train harder, like you've already said. And in that time, that then influences the other people around you. They see us training hard, so they need to train harder as well. And that, I think, made a, a bit, had a big impact on 
setting the mindset of the team. And I think you saw that throughout and you see that throughout in the England team at the minute. No, Jinx, and to, to hear you say that, it's very kind of you, thank you. And you actually texted me that when I retired. But what I'm disappointed at is you went on the good, bad and the rugby and you credited John Smith, Skulk Brits, all these people. <laughs> and like, you, you had the platform to share with you know, millions of people that... You know, oh, mate. Oh, listen, next time, next time, mate. Yeah, Biggest influence right. on my career, that's you. No, no, it's, uh, I, I can appreciate what those boys did for you. But I, I genuinely believe the, the competition uh, brought the best out of me and definitely for you. And you must have been, you know, chomping at the bit for, for three years there. Um, but, you know, natural selection and progression took over. And I think um, the, the challenge for you now is it's going to be coming your way. Like, you got Dickie there, but there'll be some bolter kind of coming after you and it will keep you sharp, mate. It will keep you going. Um, it will keep you on that Watt bike and keep you away from uh, those Harpenden, uh High Street restaurants. <laughs> Bill, how, do, how have you always viewed it? Um, I've always seen it as like um, character building. Um, you know, I think the coaches see it that way too, especially Eddie. He wants to see how people react to, to having someone um, potentially going for the same jersey. And, and like what you, what you boys touched on there, it just makes the team better. And, um, you know, everyone loves to compete. I, I like to compete myself. So um, if I'm told I'm up against someone else and and people keep telling me that the game's changing, I need to lose weight. Um, I need to get quicker. But I do what I do. And I don't think I can change now unless I lose 20 kilos, which is um, probably not on impossible. Don't change it. Um, it's beautiful. But I'm, but I'm happy with it. I'm happy with with having people come in, and I'll never be one to to not talk to someone if if we're competing. Um, what's what happens on the pitch stays on there, and we make sure we help each other out. Yeah, it's an interesting piece that you picked up on there, Bill. Like uh, people's reaction to competition. Like uh, you you talked about it in a good light, but we've all seen players that um, that kick stones in Eddie's words or. Yeah find uh, dark corridors and have those little saps and, and whatnot. The, the thing is, they don't last long, do they? They get out of pretty quick and it's pretty obvious. And I think in the environment that you're in, an aspirational one, if your attitude's not good, you, and it doesn't matter how good you are, you don't survive. Um, you, you've got to be pulling the same way. And, and if you're not, you stick out and you, you're gone, basically. Yeah, you're right. How have you found it? with the new crop kind of coming in? How do you see your role within that? Kind of setting those standards and, and, and sharing that. Because I've, I've been in those teams where I can imagine where you're at now, there's a whole lot of young guys in that room and you guys have been around that team for, for a long time now, like 100 games between you. Like you've got an expectation, you know what it takes to, to train and, and to play a certain way with England. Like how do you, how do you share that with those, those new boys? I think there's like a, a balance. Obviously, we've got a, a really good leadership group, um, likes of Owen, Fordy, Maro, Mako, those guys. But then I think also at the same time, you don't necessarily have to be in the, the leadership group to effectively be a leader in this team. Um, Billy does it his own way. I try and do it my own way as well. And, you know, the way that I think both of us are probably in a similar mindset of, you know, putting an arm around the younger players and making sure that they understand what's expected of you in the group. Also having an understanding that it can be difficult to do at times in a changing environment, uh, the, pr the added pressures of international rugby, all the rest of it. And that's where we need to make sure that we're as relatable as we can be. And we put a lot of time and effort into building relationships, um, getting to know people that we don't know. And we have a big responsibility for that. You know, the, like you said, the social element of things is, is huge when you're in camp, um, especially for us now. Added in the fact that we're in a bubble, uh, can't go out for coffees, can't go out for dinners. So we're going to have to get a little bit innovative in terms of the way that we that we go about things. But um, Jinx, you never went out for coffees anyway. You just had them in your room. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, people did go out for coffee. Mate, there was nowhere to go for coffee in bag shot. Oh, don't do bag shot like that, mate. It's got good Chinese takeaway. Um, True. But no, you 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 boys um, to to me uh, playing with you. I always saw you as guys who just love it, like really enjoy the social element of it. Um, and I probably kick myself a bit um, because I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have. And maybe that came with uh, workload and, and stress and uh, Jinx basically pushing me and pushing me and pushing me to a place like where I couldn't go anymore. But do you continue to find that enjoyment? 
Is, is that what you base your kind of uh, participation in rugby around, playing the game? Yeah, definitely. I think that's one thing that um, is pretty high up my list when it comes to, to playing. Wherever I'm playing is, is whether I'm enjoying it. And you know this for a fact is when you're here, there's, there's a lot on your plate. Um, you've got your plays to learn. You've got to be somewhere on time. You've got so many things going that sometimes you forget that you're playing, the way you play rugby is through instinct. And that's how I play my game. So if I'm not happy, I'll just tell someone um, open and honestly and make sure that I am enjoying because that's, that's where I feel like I play my best rugby. And um, a lot of the young boys coming through, I know there's new guys who are a bit older, but the young guys that come through, they, a lot of them, when I watch the Prem, they play through instinct. Um, and I just try and share with them if they, ever they want to talk about that um, rather than tell them off. And I leave all the dirty work to, to the leadership boys. And uh, I always come in and do all the fluffy, lovey stuff. Yeah, it's a good cop, bad cop. It's like we're, we're playing good cop the entire time. It's great. <laughs> Jinx, you must, I, I see you both in, in a leadership role. You, you were in a leadership role when, when I played with you, you know. So, like, you guys seem to strike a real good balance of, um, of, of that sort of seniority and that high standards. But equally, um, maybe it's a bit different now. Uh, that you've got a bit older, but do you still enjoy it off the field as much? And are you are you more professional now? Are you more diligent, or are you the same? It is a bit like I just think that that's where our mindset stems from, um, and we try and bring that into it. But at the same time, what I was going to say is, it's like as much as we're both very positive people, there's also, of course, going to be times in the eight weeks that or whatever when we're in camp that you're having the difficult times. But I think that's where. We've got such a good group of players, good group of mates. You can build good relationships with people that, you know, you're able to sort of have those saps with people. They are, they are ultimately going to be positive. You need to get things off your chest and you have good good conversations with people that put you back in the right mindset. But I think my, where my head's at with it all is that everything that I do when I'm, we're in a team environment, I always think that you have an effect on the person next to you. You have an effect on the group. And so always, whenever I'm in that team environment, whether it's just in the team room or in training or in the gym, I try and be as positive and as energetic as I possibly can. Bill, you are looking forward to fatherhood? No, I am. Um, me and my wife decided not to find out the sex of the baby until um, obviously she gives birth. So uh, we're excited about that. And then also after that, um, everyone's just told me that I'm going to have no sleep. So hopefully camp can be my... Um, little lifesaver but I'm so excited and also I've seen my little nephews and uh, people keep telling me that you love your kid more than your nephew so I'm excited for that as well because um, I love hanging out with them even though that means going to Michael's house and being told to clean up his house but um, I'm looking forward to it and uh, so is my wife. <laughs> I was going to say um, th throughout my career I used to you know like just love playing and like away games were just like you know they were just like a home game but the older I got, I started to appreciate an away game a bit more. Like a little Friday night away, like took my own pillow. It was like I could go to bed when I wanted. I could sleep in to like nine, t oh, nine, nine o'clock even was a sleeping. I started to love it. Jinx, I've seen you, the, the bizzo's ticking over. Bizzo's doing all right, mate. Productive lockdown. Yeah. Are you, uh, is, are you hands on in, in, the, in the premises or not? <laughs> I'm not a physio, mate. I'm not. I'm not handing rubs out. So, uh, no. um, but you're not. You're not. You're not outside with flyers, kind of like. Come on in. <laughs> on Radley High Street. No, no, no. Yeah. So we've opened up the new one. I, um, usually, mate. Like, obviously, in the sort of business side of things, in when we were first setting up the first clinic, I was quite heavily involved. Um, sort of getting together the business plan and try and get everything up and running. But obviously, day to day, I can't do too much. Uh, and then. Obviously, with lockdown happening, at the start of lockdown, I was like, well, I want to try and invest more time into the into the business. So um, it gave me a bit more of a routine and we sort of worked out and looked at some numbers and worked out that we might might do our right opening a second clinic. So we've opened up a second one in Radlett and think it only opened on Monday. So it's been all right so far. So hopefully it kicks off. Only business to open another shop during COVID. Yeah, mate, we're taking a risk, but we're, we're going to take this thing head on. <laughs> Um, question, the, the master, right? Eddie, the boss, he, he plays everyone slightly different. He keeps everyone on their toes, uh, speaks to people and motivates people in different ways. How's, how's your, your links with Eddie? How's he, how's he talking to you boys at the minute? Mine's always short and sweet. Like, 
it's all it's either like good mate or you know it's it's, it's pretty like never that detailed um but yeah i mean he's just he's pretty straight to the point with me which i actually much prefer like that's the thing with him that you just you know what you're gonna get uh bill what what's he saying to you mate he loves you billy he loves you mate yeah, I was just going to say, I think he, he probably, I remind him of um, probably the kids that he, he used to hang out with when he was younger, so he probably feels sorry for me a little bit. What, the Ellers? So, yeah, so he has to look after me. Not the Ellers, probably the other boys, not them. Um, but I think he just looks out for me and, and tries to sometimes protect me, um, and I appreciate that a lot. But still, it's, it's, it's all short and sharp. He used to give me, like, uh, printouts and, like, podcasts and books and stuff. And he gave me this book on baseball one day. And he was like, mate, really good book. Give this a read, mate. Tell me what you think. And like about two years later, I never read the book. And like he kept on asking me, how's the book? And I was like, oh, I, you know, I haven't started yet. And then it went on a while. And I was like, yeah, it's all right. It's all right. And then I bumped into him like, I don't know, say six to 12 months ago. I said, you know that book that you gave me? Did you ever read it? And he's like, nah, mate, someone gave it to me. <laughs> so, like, he used to do it all the time, though. He'd be like, he'd be like, mate, read this or listen to that. And, tell me, and he hadn't even listened to it to himself. But, um, yeah, interesting. But uh, do you know what? The, um, he, he, always, he always had that kind of personal touch, which was cool, but then always gave me a pretty clear direction in what he wanted from me as well, which made my sort of job really kind of clear cut in a way instead of worrying about a whole lot of things he just said I want this this and this from you and in terms of like a rugby thing Jinx um be interesting to to know what he said to you um but all he wanted from me was to be world class at set piece to hit rucks and to be defensively sound and he didn't even say like be like Courtney defensively he just said make your tackles so like when I played um all I had to do was my set piece, ruck and tackle. And like, obviously you would come on and do your thing and everyone would be like, why can't Dylan do what Jamie's doing? I was just like, <laughs> but I actually took great sort of, um, like I had like an inner peace almost that I just knew the only person that I needed to impress or hit my numbers with was Eddie because he was looking at rucks, tackle, set piece uh, and you would come on and do your thing. And that kind of ties into my next question. People want me to talk about 2016. Um, you know, that Six Nations and that Australia tour, just your boys' sort of memories on that. Because Jinx, you, you were kind of, um, I'd say, instrumental. Billy, you were kind of pivotal in, in that, that tour especially. What are, what are your boys' memories of that, that year? Well, it was my, my sort of first year properly in camp. It was like my first real time in the group. Um, I just remember like from the very word go, it was like, you felt like something good was coming. Do you know what I mean? Like we felt like you were going to be a part of something very special. Uh, and Eddie set out pretty early doors and you and Faz and, and the other boys drove that really well. Um, and like the, the memories from it, like obviously I, I, so I, I then got, I then got injured to, uh, two games in, in on training on a Tuesday before the Wales game. So missed, missed the last game. I missed the Grand Slam game um, in France, which was heartbreaking, but um, see you boys go on and do it. it was class and then that Australia tour mate it was just unreal wasn't it like the build of momentum that we had people didn't think we could go and do it yeah we hadn't won a series over there in however long and we played some pretty cool rugby along the way and I think every test was very different like we, the first test we came back we showed like brilliant resilience second test was like was it that the one that was like really tight and we sort of dug it out and defended really well and then the third test we scored like eight tries so it was pretty cool Bill yeah, I think um, that start of Eddie's era was um, like sits with me because of what he did for the team and for myself. Um, the questions he asked and, and the way he asked the group as to why we've been so rubbish because we've got so many players to pick from. Um, it kind of changed my mindset as well in terms of how I looked at myself in terms of uh, world rugby, not just um, domestics. And I think... Um, he enabled us to think out of the box and, and that's why we kind of pushed on from that point to, to where we got to by the end of the, the Australian tour. And the Aussie tour was probably the funniest experience I've ever had on a tour. Um, not just the rugby, but off the pitch, 
we used to compete like anything um, during training and after we just hang out with each other, go for coffees, pancakes. I remember Hass took me for story time once and I remember that vividly. That was unbelievable. And those things sit with me still. And, and I think that came down to just a perfect mixture of, of the rugby and, and the people that we had in that group. And it wasn't just the Australian tour. It, it started from, from when Eddie first came in. Training was a bit harder, but it meant that um, we ended up where we were in Paris. I remember kind of pre, pre-Eddie, we tiptoed, especially in the media, around talking about winning. And it was all about humility and respect and, and big things that should be aligned with rugby. But when you're in um, our position, all we want to do is win. And Eddie just said, stop talking about culture, stop talking about wanting to play for England. The, all those things are important, but the crucial thing to it all is winning. So Eddie just started talking about winning. And like to hear him in his presses um, actually inspired me to start speaking in a certain way when I did media, uh, speaking with conviction about winning. And then I think it was almost like self-fulfilling. All the players started talking about winning and we, we kind of ratcheted up that real competitive element to our game. But Jinx, do you, do you agree it was kind of empowering? Yeah, definitely, mate, yeah. And I think, I think his man management was, is exceptional. Like, it, um, like I said, he takes a lot of the brunt himself. He puts himself out there and puts the team out there and, and sort of expects us to back it up. Um, but the individual conversations that he's having throughout the week, I think, are, are brilliant. You know, everyone seems to have a good relationship with him and something else going on. Do you know what I mean? Like he's pushing other people, he's bigging other people up at different times, keeping everyone on their toes constantly. And then with regards to the team, like you said, I just think he, the way that he builds throughout a week is just uh, so clever in terms of the way that he makes the team feel by the weekend. Like, you know, he pushes us super hard Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the recovery day, he's walking around saying how good we looked on the Wednesday. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like... Bill, we have another uh, pancake. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sitting in the spa and a pancake and Eddie's telling me I look decent. It's like, brilliant. Um, but yeah, no, it's, the, the way that he does that and the, his messages to the team throughout the week, I think are very clever. And he always says that he sort of hands things over, you know, pretty early on in the week, but especially later on in the week towards the players and it, that making you feel probably more that the plan is yours and you have to own it more. And I think he does that really well. Yeah. Hey, um, just to sort of go back to what Bill said about how everyone off the field in Australia and the why it was so successful. Do you know one of the reasons I think it was so successful is because the guys that didn't play, um, you, you take 10 guys uh, extra on tour, I suppose, that aren't going to play at the weekend keeping those guys kind of aligned with the team and focused at the end of a season is very hard. But he basically pulled Alice Genge from nowhere. I had no, who, no idea who Alice Genge was. He was like, who's this kid? And he takes him on tour and he had sinks and he brought sinks. And like on a Wednesday or a Thursday, like sinks and Genge weren't playing. And it would it'd almost be, you know, like, there's, it's not a gentleman's agreement, but there's an understanding by Thursday what training looks like. It's fast training. It's not physical training. And Eddie would be like, guys, today's a fast day. It's a, a good day to get yourself feeling good. You know, execute your moves, get that understanding, iron out anything that you want. Um, take it, you know, we don't need any injuries and that sort of stuff. And then on the way to training on the bus, he'd be like, Sinks, come sit next to me. Genj, come sit next to me. He'd be like, I want you guys full on today. You better be going at each other. So Sinks and Genj are charging about going for each other or, or kind of going for the, uh, the starting 15 because the boss is basically kind of whispered in their ear. That's what you're here to do. So all of a sudden, training just like notches up a bit. Um, but I reckon, you know, the the success of that tour was probably built on the guys that um, that weren't actually playing. I was in that non-23 for the first week, and it was like it was class. I think I think the the it's a sign of a good environment, like a positive environment that you always you always feel a part of it the whole time. I think that was something we did really well in Japan as well. Now you boys are heading towards your, uh, well, not your twilight years, but you're a little bit older. Who are those young guys that are like charging around, upsetting training, that need Oli. just? Oli Thorley. Oli Thorley. Mate, mate, the man is a madman. Honestly, like, mate, he's, he's like, we're all just like rocking up to training, you know, twenty minutes. Like Bill's rocking down in his Birkenstocks, you know, just <laughs> bowling down there. 
And like Thorley's got his headphones on, <laughs> might as well have an anthem jacket on. He is priming and ready for training. And he goes hundy every time. I'm like, oh my god. Yeah, the uh, the young back rowers, they go hard all young the time. Young back rowers, yeah. They're chopping on a, you know, they because of COVID and everything, they're like, right, shoulder, like shoulder in front. You got lads chopping from the back. I'm like, I look over, it's like the two settlers from Gloucester. <laughs> I'm like just puts that little seed in like are you going to be good today? Are you going to perform? What are you here for? You know, every day to get better, this sort of thing. And Jinx, I wouldn't be worried about Thorley. He's on the wing. I'll be worried about those back rowers. Do you remember, um, oh no, both you boys went on the Lions, right? So we went to Argentina with the under 18s um, with like the Curries. And, <laughs> and uh, don't worry, me and Forty held it down and, and Robbo and, and launches. But like team run day, right? Team run. We, uh, <laughs> we're literally running some some shape off nine just around the corner you know in threes group pods of three around the corner and curry has fully like shin chopped launches and launches has gone up like what the what are you doing like he's throwing his toys out it was ridiculous but i think even eddie was like mate what are you doing but like the curry boys were literally straight out of school they only knew one way and i think eddie was probably just there giving him a little prod saying uh yeah, every time you get a chance to train or play, you need to go basically 110. Boys, so 2019 was obviously huge, and I don't want to go into that. I'm all about looking forward, and I'm sure you boys are as well. What is kind of next for you guys um, in an England shirt? Where do you want to go? You're both going to be around for the next major tournament. So what, what's your kind of plans? Where, where are you going next? Jinx, I'll come to you. You're the oldest. You might not be around. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'll cling. I'm just going to cling on as much as I can. Uh, no, I don't know. I think there's there's some unfinished business, mate. Like the, you know, um, Japan was a was an amazing experience. But like you said, looking forward, I think it's a really exciting time to be a part of the group. And obviously, you've got your own personal motivations. Um, you know, and for me, I love being a part of the group and um, developing and all that stuff. So. You know, I, I just want to be a part of that, and I've got every confidence that we're going to, you know, that next major tournament is going to be uh, a very successful one. So, um, you know, you'd be gutted if you sort of took your foot off the gas over the next few years, and then you weren't a part of something that could be very, very special at the end of it. Bill, what about you? What's what's your kind of goals, aspirations? Where do you want to go next, mate? I'd love to push for the Lions. I think you, you said earlier that we both went on the Lions, but I actually tore my shoulder off the bone, so. <laughs> I could go on that one. Um, that's a goal of mine. These next few Six Nations is is a great opportunity for us to to win as many as we can and um, just dominate. And and I want to be a part of that. It's funny that uh, Ed, Eddie comes out with you know strong statements like that, but I wouldn't want to be in any other team. You know, settling for mediocrity. I wouldn't be saying, oh, I want to be a top four side or a top six side." You know, like that's one of when I talk about the psychological kind of warfare or weaponry that he added to us. Day one, when he came in in 2016, he goes, boys, you're going to be the best team in the world and you're going to, you're going to hold the William Webb Alice. And I don't think, he, he said at the time, none of you believe me. But then as you start kind of talking about it, you start performing, training goes up, you start winning. I think the boys started to believe it. And guess what? You boys basically got yourselves all the way there. And on another day, you, you fulfill that kind of statement that was made four years earlier. Jinx and Billy, we're going to play a little game here. It's called The Greatest. You need to tell me what your greatest or favourite one of these is. So, Jinx, you first. Uh, the greatest roast dinner for you? My mum's roast dinner, of course. Yeah, but Jinx, you need to tell me what roast dinner this is. Lamb, mate. Roast lamb. Yeah, I was going to say, are we, are we, are we plant-based nut roast? Are we pork? Are we, are we... No, no, no. We're roast lamb. We're looking at roast lamb with a Yorkshire pudding because my mum's from Yorkshire, of course. Um, that cauliflower cheese. Stuffing? You can throw some stuff. No, not with lamb, mate. Not really. Um, oh, jinx, jinx don't do stuffing. No, no, no. Mate, this is on a high carb day. Um, and then, you know, there's some just good quality roast potatoes with thick gravy. All right, Jinx, that's plenty. Thank you. Uh, Billy, the greatest floor filler at a wedding. Apple bottom jeans. That song. <laughs> you know, fired up with that. Boots with the fur. Yeah. <laughs> Jinxie, uh, the greatest... Try celebration. Although that one, like, what was it? The Argentinian bloke who like jumped in the sands and clapped himself. I like that. Who was that? 
Consapone. Consapone. I, I like the, the humble one or the, the quietly arrogant Danny Care sniff, like the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's expected, you know. Actually, Liam, William, Liam Williams, mate. Liam Williams does this, like, uh, you know, like... Simmer down, like, calm. Relax. Just calm yeah. down, yeah. Uh, Billy, uh, the greatest cheat meal. Pizza is easy and um, nice, easy way to get carbs down you. We've got one more each. Uh, Jinx, the greatest sporting inspiration. Dylan Hartley. Oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> this ain't a comedy. If you asked for it, mate, you get it. <laughs> uh, Jinx, the greatest prank. It's happened at the club as someone like um, Kling filmed someone's car, mm. the whole thing, and it was that was like. Someone? That's above and beyond. Someone? Uh, it was, I think it was Caruso's car. Yeah, but who... <laughs> yeah, I want to know who the someone <laughs> or the someones were. I can't name names, you know. You know that. I can't. Okay, Billy, last one. Music again. The greatest slow jam. Oh, no. Yeah, sexual healing, Marvin Gaye. How good? Very good. Uh, Jamie, George and Billy Vunapola. Thank you, boys. It's really good to see you. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for your time. Enjoy uh, contact conditioning. <laughs>